Hi, I'm Lynn Chang. I'm a gastroenterologist on faculty at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. And I'm going to talk to you today about irritable bowel syndrome, or what we commonly know as IBS. Now, this is a very common condition that occurs in children and in adults. And in some studies, the prevalence is up to 11% of the general population, and that has a worldwide prevalence. So it's not specific to certain parts of the world. But it's characterized by chronic or recurrent abdominal pain that's associated with diarrhea or constipation or both diarrhea and constipation. And patients typically have symptoms for at least six months. Unfortunately, we don't have a diagnostic marker like a blood test that definitively and reliably diagnoses all patients with IBS. So currently we use symptom-based criteria. And the one that we use right now is called the Rome criteria. And we are now in the fourth iteration. But it basically requires that the patients have chronic recurrent abdominal pain. And it has to be associated with two out of three features. And that it has to be associated with having a bowel movement. It could, the pain could get better with a bowel movement, which is typical, or it could actually get worse transiently after a bowel movement. It can also be associated with a change in stool frequency. And the normal stool frequency in the general population is three times a day to three times a week. That's the normal range. So going outside of that range would be abnormal. And if that's associated with pain, that could be a sign of, of IBS. Also, the other third feature is a change in stool form. So that means the loose, watery stools of diarrhea or the hard, lumpy, dry stools of constipation. So when abdominal pain is associated with those two, at least two of those three features, it meets the criteria for IBS. But that can meet the criteria for many patients. So we also have to differentiate IBS from other diseases that can mimic the symptoms of IBS. And that would include celiac disease, uh, gluten intolerance, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Many of those conditions we can measure blood tests or we can get biopsies from endoscopy to confirm those. Um, but what basically we look for is we do a few diagnostic tests. We also look for what we call red flags or alarm features like bloody stools, unintentional weight loss, a family history of colon cancer, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease. Most IBS patients do not have those red flags. Um, and then we just do some just very focused diagnostic tests, and not a whole battery of different tests. That's actually, the scientific evidence shows that it's not beneficial to do that. Make the diagnosis based on the symptom criteria, and then we treat the patients. Uh, so there are multiple causes of IBS. I think it's a multifactorial condition. There are factors that can increase the risk of getting IBS, and that can include having a family history, having an infection, like a gut infection, food poisoning, <clears throat> and then it, the infection goes away, but you still have symptoms of IBS. Um, having stressful life events can increase the risk. And then the, the IBS is, occurs because of a dysregulator, an altered brain-gut communication. We call that brain-gut interactions. Um, and when that occurs, you can have a lot of different physiologic changes where the motility of your bowel is too fast or too slow, the bowel is more sensitive, the way that the brain perceives the information from the gut can be altered and enhanced, um, the immune uh, system and the microbiota can be altered. So, so there's a series of physiologic disturbances that we can't always measure on routine tests, but of a lot of our research support that it, they're abnormal. Now once a patient gets IBS, you can have certain factors that trigger symptoms. Stress can trigger symptoms, foods can trigger symptoms, a lot of that, of these high FODMAP foods. So it depends on your symptoms, and it depends on the severity of your symptoms. So if your symptoms are very mild, they don't really impact your quality of life. Diet can be very helpful, uh, just exercise, getting good sleep. Uh, some simple over-the-counter remedies. If you have diarrhea, you can take these anti-diarrheal agents like loperamide or amodium. If you have constipation, you could use fiber like psyllium. Uh, when your symptoms are getting to be more moderately severe, where it's starting to impact 
your daily activities, maybe interfering with going to school or going to work, then usually you should see a doctor and get a prescription uh, medications. There's a whole host of different prescription medications based on your symptoms that can be very helpful in reducing your pain, diarrhea, or your constipation. And also, there are non-pharmacologic or non-medical therapies like behavioral therapy. There's a lot of evidence that behavioral therapy, um, like cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis, um, to, uh, let's see, mindfulness, so education, a lot of those types of behavioral and educational information can be very useful in IBS. So I would definitely say that if you have it, the symptoms are treatable. There's a lot on the internet. You just want to make sure that you're going to reputable websites where they're giving you accurate information. And please seek medical attention because there are remedies that your healthcare provider can recommend to you that can very easily uh, treat your symptoms so that you can have a more normal quality of life.